Look up in the sky at the birds that play. It's- Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. And you're listening to The Krypton Report. Welcome to The Krypton Report Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler. And with me today is my partner in crime, the Superman of Red, Mr. James Cole. Hello, James. Hey, Tyler. And with us also is returning guest, uh, artist. You may know him if you uh, have uh, <clears throat> his artwork. If you uh, listen to our friend Anthony Desiados digging for kryptonite, he did the artwork. Mr. Isaiah Simmons, welcome. Thank you for having me back. No problem. And Isaiah is recording coming from his car because sometimes yep. that's what life deals us. It's, <laughs> it's like when they ask me for the doctor, like, you want to do a telehealth appointment? I'm like, no, I have nowhere to go but my car. And that's yeah. sometimes. And they're like, oh, we can do that. I'm like, nah, it's okay. I just come to the office. Yeah, um, normally I'd record from my room, but it's a little bit of a mess right now. So I did not want to to try to get that set up. It that's, why my, that's why my camera's angled up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This is a podcast that we have been trying for a while. James and I have had this. I think we've had this book on the docket for like two years. Uh, We just couldn't find the best time to do it. And we alluded to this recording back when we finished up the last volume of the New 52. Um, And then Isaiah was reading it and had posted online that he had read it. And was talking about it. I said, dude, do you want to talk about it? Because we're going to do this. But then, of course, life happens and we've had to reschedule. So I do... Bear with us, listeners, as we try to go through this, because it's been now a little bit of time, and I was going to brush up on it again, um, but if you've seen my socials, you know I I, uh, had a family tragedy happen, and my mind's just not kind of been there, but I really wanted to get back into recording to kind of just do something fun, and uh, we are here, and today we are talking about Superman Doom. This was from the New 52 era, and I feel like it was a really great story that kind of gets overlooked. I feel like it's one of those more original New 52 uh, stories that doesn't get credit that it deserves. Oh, I mean, I definitely agree, you know, as kind of as being a Doomsday fan, uh, you know, one of the one of the earliest comics that I read that I got from the library was the death of Superman. <laughs> um, you know, so to see this be a different, ver- like a somewhat different version, it it kind of progressing the, the character along in a way, you know, not just not trying to make him some kind of more like intelligible character as they had kind of done in the past, um, trying to bring Doomsday back, but bringing him back as this this still unstoppable killing machine and killing machine. Yeah. And, and continuing to pursue that even after, you know, Superman rips him in half. What was your overall thought Isaiah when you uh, first like read this? Well, so uh, actually I believe that I read this one um, before I ever read the original death of Superman. Cause uh, like I'm 24 right now, so back when the new 52 was like in its like the height of its, you know, it was going along. Uh, I was probably like I don't know 12, 13. That's really when I started reading comics. So I I read this before that, and I thought I thought it was cool. Um, I didn't have like a comic shop in the town where I lived where I could go to it every month, so I pretty much had to wait for the trade. But I was like following it along or following along with it, like on the DC website and everything. I mean, I thought it was cool because like. You know, for a while, when it first happened and they're like, oh, he killed Doomsday and then he turns into Doomsday. I was like, well, it'll be, I don't know, two or three issues and it'll be back to normal. But then it like went on for like the whole summer. And I was genuinely surprised. Again, this is from the standpoint of someone who's like 12, 13, at how long it was going on. And I was like, like, that was the first time that um, that there was like a story like that where I was following along with it. And then eventually I was able to get the trade. And, and I, I remember liking it. Like, like, I think, I don't remember if you said it before we started recording. Recording, but it does feel a little it can feel a little bloated at times like there are a lot of tie-ins um but i think like the main story and the main idea i really like there might have just been like a few execution things they could have done better and first point is isaiah is perfect representation of like the importance of what the new 52 represented to bring in new readers you know so often people like in you know james and i are a little older than you um you know people like our age or older hate on the new 52 but it was important to establish new readers and bring a younger audience. And Isaiah is proof of that. 
Um, I think, like I've said this before, I think sometimes comic writers have great ideas and then they take it and convolute it and it gets weird and over like explanatory or um, one of my best examples is what Peter Tomasi did in his script for the death of Superman animated film compared to the book. And I've often said that the Superman doomed would have been an amazing animated film. Like you streamline this story and um, we, we, you know, we have, let's see, it's August. So here in October, we're going to be visiting a new death of Superman storyline with Superman and Lois um, after fighting doomsday. So that's one reason we really want to talk about this. Um, I mentioned this briefly on a previous recording, but I'll share with you guys. Solomon and I were talking about um, when they announced season three of my adventures with Superman and the way that show's been, if they were to do doomsday, I think this is the route to do it. Um, okay. Have you watched my adventures, Isaiah? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like you know how like that when the kryptonite gets them, they already get like this like spikes kind of and yeah. Like, infected. Yeah. And I was like, the idea of this doomsday virus basically um, would be really cool to explore. I think on that show, mm-hmm. instead of just doing the if they were going to go that route, instead of just doing the typical doomsday story. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. I think I think too um like the show's great. I love the show. But I think that might work a little better too cuz I think uh if they were to do some sort of adaptation of like a physical doomsday like the monster, I don't know how uh how that version of Superman would fare against that. Cuz again, I love the show, but it's a little more um like soft and he struggles a little bit. And again, that's fine, but I feel like I agree with you that if they did the virus thing, that would be a a little better fit for that show yeah that would be an excellent thing to talk to to explore in the show to bring in doomsday but you know we talk about uh, especially tyler like in my opinion like evil superman is is like one of the scariest things you know what i mean i mean it's it's basically like it's, it's almost like dark side to a degree you know just just scary and and evil and deadly um like so deadly uh but a lot of people and tyler has been vocal about it about you know they do a lot of evil superman and um you know i think there are different ways they've done it that are compelling and really good but surprisingly one of the ways that they haven't taken superman in a route you know to make superman the bad guy but ultimately not be the bad guy in the end, like, like say in justice where he has turned and he is the bad guy. Um, you know, like he is on, on the top as one of the worst in, in the injustice universe, but they're they're Every time they try to bring like a redemption around for that version of Superman, he kind of fights against that. Um, but, you know, to do Superman doomed in one way or another would be a way to do an evil Superman who has a redemption who comes back because it's not necessarily him, but it's it's a version of a mind controlled Superman, a version of a, you know, a very deadly uh, evil version. Exactly. I mean, it's a it's something we haven't seen that. I think is unique and I I have my own pitch idea of how to use this character in the future. But let's get into the book. Uh James and I have been and we recommended this to Isaiah. Check out Ollie's. Uh I think I got this whole thick um graphic novel that is compre- that retail value is 30 bucks. I think I got it for like six. It was I have the individual issues. But it was just much easier to just pick this up um, a while back at Ollie's. And, but we're going to get into this and kind of talk about it. But let's start off. Um, I do, James, I do want to bring up something I was thinking that we haven't touched on as part of our reading of, that we've been doing going through the New 52 is where is Doomsday? I think Doomsday appeared, if I remember backwards. He came out of the Superman Wonder Woman book. Um, because he hasn't appeared yet in Superman, and we're going to be reviewing uh, action later. But I think he appeared from the from the. Um, 
Yeah, I can't just... remember where Doomsday first appeared in the New 52. It has been a while since I read the Superman Wonder Woman book. Um, I did read it early on when the app first started, and that was 2018 now. So it was quite a, it was quite a while ago when I read through that, uh, that line. Um, same thing with action. So, I mean, we're going to be going to action here as soon as we finish up. Um, and yeah, we were talking about the Superman books and all the tie-ins. Like in the last trade we discussed, the last issue or two was the first couple of issues you get in, in this trade. Um, just the way that the stories required uh, reading different books to get the complete uh, story, you know? Like the tie-ins for the current like House of Brainiac. Like I read those and you know the, the Green Lantern tie-in was very loose. <laughs> and and then the, the Power Girl tie-in books, but those were the only two books that had tie-in stories with it. It was all how it was all, all action and Superman. And the, the tie-ins for those, they were still loose. Like Power Girl was loosely connected, but it was it was on Earth. It was her and crush uh, another zarnian on earth just kind of dealing with some stuff in metropolis had really nothing to do with what was going on with brainiac out in space and on his ship so like those tie-ins you can actually like take them or leave them a lot of the ones in the new 52 was literally a chapter of the story mm -hmm. so basically this starts doomsday is attacking honeymoon island and basically has obliterated honeymoon island it looks like pompeii because like he when he appeared like the water was boiling and he has basically just destroyed this island and superman you know is flying down trying to rescue the military is attacking it we get introduced to dr shea veritas um and then meanwhile why that's going on we have this whole other subplot that runs through this book and this is where i talk about streamlining the story of all the people in a coma in smallville that we have lois lane and lana lang working together to figure out this coma thing in smallville and that's why like i'm like okay if we could just focus on the doomsday aspect this would be a much more interesting story and that's where I go back to the comics being overly convoluted. Right. Well, in the so in the comic, they have the the reason that that's coming around is is that um, Brainiac has actually worked with um, uh, Zadu, the the Phantom King, in the Phantom Zone, and and released Doomsday in an effort to like pave his way first. Either Doomsday would, you know, kind of destroy earth or as it turns out you know infect superman and force him in, in in a lot of different for a lot of different reasons leave earth leave earth unprotected for brainiac's arrival so you know in the comics that's you know they there there's all those different layers instead of just like this doomsday if they streamlined it, I mean, it might just be the arrival of Doomsday and him being this, because in this one, he's evolved and he's yeah. producing what they call death spores. And so anything within his vicinity is like dying. The water's mm. boiling, uh, plants and animals are bursting into flame, their life force being drained, just just complete and utter annihilation all, all around him. So what... Isaiah, as an overarch, how do you feel just with the way Doomsday is brought in and the whole setup of this story? I was I was sitting here trying to remember the the coma thing, and then you said it was Brainiac. I was like, I thought because that that leads to Lois like getting. Am I am I conflating two stories? No, That's, no, no it's actually this is this is this is further along in the story after okay, she yeah. had the psionic war uh, yeah. storyline. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. I was trying to remember that. I did really like, um, and I forgot about it until just now, the whole thing where you talked about the the spores or whatever, where everything around him is, like, physically affected. I thought that was a really cool um, addition to it. Like, 
like you said, I know it's it's popular to hate on the new 52, and a lot of stuff they did was like, a lot of it was a mess. Some of it was good, a lot of it was a mess. Um, but I did like when they would occasionally like add stuff that was actually interesting and like made sense and like that. That makes sense because you know when um, back in the like you know Death of Superman comics, he's conceived as just like a, the perfect killing machine. I like taking that a step farther to where it's like. It's not just that he's physically killing everything, like everything around him is also dying just from him being there. And I really liked, I like that ad- addition to it as well. So we have the, we have Steel and Wonder Woman show up and are battling Doomsday. And then Superman shows up and he battles with him. And like you said, Doomsday's destroying everything. And he, and Doomsday leaves. And then we have the Justice League talking about the threat of Doomsday. And, um, we have basically the scene of Superman um, going to Mumbai, India, and showing up and saving a family. And he starts taking Doomsday and beating him and takes him into, you know, Venus, which I thought was hardcore. Like, and it's him battling him on Venus is where Superman basically uses his hit heat vision, rips him in half, and burns him. And it's during that whole thing is when he rips him in half and then he inhales all of those spores to keep them from spreading. And yeah, they, they had crashed back. They had crashed back down to Smallville. And that's when he decided, like, there's all these people, his family, his friends. Lois is there. Lana's there. And that's when he decided to do what he did um, after he kind of got a a go ahead from Veritas that Doomsday is not really a, um, a, a conscious being, you mm-hmm. know, with anything other than rage and death and destruction with inside of it. So like, he got a justification for himself to kind of, if he needed to go this route, he could kill Doomsday. And we get this, this next chapter of, uh, you know, Superman's, there's little things that we see where Superman's temper is starting to lose. He breaks Lex Luthor's arm. Uh, he attacks some poachers violently who were hunting and killing wild animals. And we see just little things where it seems like he's breaking. Uh, we get an awesome thing of steel taking a basic liquid steel bath to protect himself and to stay with him. And... One of my favorites is the uh, this idea we have of like Clark right here as he's walking and has like the shadow of Doomsday where we realize that Doomsday is kind of this um, in the background in his mind. Yeah, one of the first things he he kind of feels and sees after he rips Doomsday in half kind of already just like him. So, we have Diana go to his apartment and deal, and uh, she confronts a creature and then it cuts back and we see Clark in the Daily Planet and he we see his hand with some spikes on it and he starts talking to her about what's going on and like it's very shadowed like how they treat hiding Clark you know, and seeing him actually revealed as Doomsday. And Diana talks with Lois. And, you know, then we have our first look at what Clark's turning into here. Mm-hmm. Where he's basically almost like a split personality. Where there's like this Doomsday personality and a regular man and he's battling inside of it. Yeah, it, it's pretty cool how the how the the infection when when it starts to take hold, he transforms, and then when he fights it off, it retreats back in, and he and he returns to normal. See, so you get that you get that a few different times, um, and and you get Batman talking about how he could that that Clark could actually consciously fight the virus Mm -hmm. within him. But then we get, like, I kind of wish this was written by one writer, 
Because we get to this. Where, like, Clark surrenders himself to be looked at and studied. Of course, by Luther and all the other scientists. And he's kind of going in and out of being Clark and being Doomsday. But then this is where we get the reveal that Lois is basically being possessed by Brainiac. And we get to see that there's a bigger plan for Brainiac. And then, like, I like Clark when he's in these type of stages. Where he's, like, got Doomsday-esque-ness coming out of him. And he starts, like, sometimes he's regular Clark, sometimes he's not. Like, his, his mental state. And... Like it, it keeps going on where we have Clark interacting with the other heroes, like such as Steel, and doing missions, but he's much more violent. Like when he takes on Metallo, the Atomic Skull, he basically ends up killing Metallo. And then um, he's basically fully turning oop, into Doomsday. James, you're on mute, buddy. You're the talking on mute. Oh, I, yeah, sorry. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> um, yeah, the interesting thing there about when Metallo sacrifices himself, like they send a team like Atomic Skull, Metallo, um, Steel is there to help uh, Superman, but they, they send him and there's this giant explosion and it releases kryptonite into the atmosphere. So like the entire... Earth's atmosphere is laced with kryptonite and it weakens Superman to the point where the doomsday infection starts to take control of him because he is he himself is weakened. Yeah. Um, I do like when we get this like right here where it's like he's battling inside his own brain and we see a representation of Clark and then a representation of doomsday. Like we see who's fighting and then who comes out in the physical world. It's honestly almost now that I'm looking at it again, it's almost like uh not not seeing they're they're copying that, but that's a very um Hulk esque thing where it's the uh, the two personalities fighting over each other. I mean I think it works for this story. I, I just thought it was an interesting I, d- I do think it works. And I would have liked I like I said I think I would have liked more of that focus I and agree. to really dial in with taking your time with this story and letting like it really, I mean, you could have done almost a whole year of just Clark all of a sudden having these uh, outbursts and anger and no one's not sure why. And then he slowly starts turning into doomsday. And then over time, like, like little things here and there, like just the little bit of spikes on his face and then no one sees, you know what I'm saying? And then we're believe- progressing. And didn't they do something similar in the 90s when he came back? Because after, um, like, Reign of the Superman, when he got his powers boosted, and then he was, like, they slowly hinted at him getting, like, more and more powerful until there was... And, like, it did get weird where he was all of a sudden, like, really big and hulking and everything, like, he was too powerful. I think they did a similar thing like that yeah. where they did little teases for a while. Um, but I just... It's like, I like this story idea with Doomsday, but I just don't like some of the way... It gets executed, you know, as we go through, because like he leaves the atmosphere because of the kryptonite and that helps him, you know, bring Doomsday back. But then the Red Lanterns show up, which pisses him off and he releases Doomsday and attacks them. And at this time, Supergirl is a Red Lantern. I do like this part, though, where they do they do aim him, you know, like if you have if you have this rage, you have this, you know, aim it towards something. Um that's going to help people. Mm-hmm. And see, now it takes on a whole new level because now it's like a space odyssey of him out in space doing things and help and working and dealing with the rage. While you have the whole storyline of Lois and Lana back on Earth, where Steel comes into play, and then somebody else shows up, and that would be the cyborg Superman of the New Fifty Two. Which we all know is Zorro. Yeah, well, Superman doomed, you know, we 
it's the the trade is 500 pages yeah it is so there's there's a lot of a lot of story there it's it's got a lot of stuff i mean like you say if if it was more focused if it was more focused in you know a couple of books as opposed to how many books across how many issues you know um I think you would have definitely gotten because because the best parts of the story are are when Superman is is fighting it, fighting Doomsday. Like you said, the the scene inside uh, inside the scenes, many of them throughout this book inside of his head as he's as he's arguing with Doomsday as they're fighting. Um, yeah, very, very Hulk. Like he's a very like, in, you know, you see that Ang Lee, you see that in the Ang Lee Hulk, especially from 2003. Um you know, images like that. Um, they really did with this book. They really did get a, a lot of people in Superman's orbit involved in this story, though. I feel like this is a too many cooks in the kitchen story. But I do find it easy because then we get is when Lois officially gets taken over by Brainiac. So now we have Superman basically possessed by Doomsday and Lois possessed by Brainiac. What that sounds horrible. <laughs> it's you know during this time that like I said we have Superman and Super Doomed out there battling. Uh, shoot, I gotta go this way. Um, you know the, the um, cyborg Zor-El cyber yeah. cyborg. Yeah, and then the Justice League are on Earth dealing with the Brainiac stuff. And you have Super Doomed attacking uh, just different things in space. But I like this stuff where it's Clark battling in his mind. You know, and then you have Diana trying to battle for his soul. You have Steel falling in love with Lana. Yep, now they're getting married. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have uh, when Brainiac officially shows up. What did yeah, you we... think of the new 52 Brainiac ship where it's like almost very organic esque? <laughs> What'd you think, Isaiah? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I honestly, I honestly can't remember. Does it still look like the skull ship? Um, let me find a, sorry. I'm oh no, to... that's okay. Let me find an image of it. Um, it's, it's, it's a massive ship. Um, when they, when they actually, when it actually, um, arrives at earth, your cyborg Superman, um, and, and a bunch of drones create a, um, a portal, a wormhole thing. Um, the way it actually shows up. Oh yeah, okay, okay. So yeah. like it's massive, larger than the planet. And I do like like how you said the more organic kind of like I like that design aesthetic for Brainiac where it's like not one hundred percent robot, not one hundred percent a person, like a little fusion of the two almost. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'm trying to think of an example. I, I can't think of any of off the top of my head, um, but I really I I like that like design philosophy for it. Just like I think there's wasn't there something similar in the convergence because there's a little tie-in after this where it's like just a big head, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and I do like that too. I think my favorite uh, my favorite Brainiac ship design will always be like the giant skull. Like, um, like have you ever seen Krypton the TV show? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, like, that's, that's why perfect, when like. we started this podcast, okay, way back when, almost 10 years ago, I'll be 10 years next year, um, the idea was we were going to cover Krypton because it had been announced. I'm sorry. Give me, nope. give me just one second. You're cool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So, like, you know, the, the Brainiac, you were talking about Brainiac. Actually, this, the later part of this story, when they, when they stopped Brainiac, um, he sees like a multiverse of of um, different Earths, different characters. Um, I think this is your beginning to convergence. Mm-hmm. 
it's alluding yeah it's alluding to that like there's a lot that happens in this book and outside it because as we go through this and we're kind of skipping over some of the lesser parts because it's a lot of repeated uh just battles and stuff i want to hit the high points because like james said it's like 500 some pages but supergirl starts in this book as a red lantern and then by the like end of it she's back to being regular supergirl because she confronts later cyborg superman learns the truth fights you know against cal as superman and then we also get history of brainiac as we learn a lot of, a bunch about his history where he came from uh, before he was brainiac and and then we eventually get what um a battle in the mind for brainiac we're going to the page here takes over to try to get brainiac out of lois it basically uh takes over and becomes super doom brainiac like that is the most ridiculous over the top ultimate villain there has ever been right there <laughs> yeah that's wild uh, so it goes from this so now not only is superman battling brainiac in his mind doomsday in his mind um and then you know it's weird because during that whole battle with Brainiac, he's, that's when he's actually able to purge everything from his system. You know, he freed Lois, he purged that out of his system. And then, like, he reappears later with a beard. He looks like James. Uh, and then he just kind of gives. I actually really like that look. I, yeah. I, that I really like that look a lot. That See, that's that's why I said back when they were freaking doing Justice League and they did that all that crap, they should have just had Henry grow a beard. He could instead have just, shaved the mustache. Instead of, instead of digitally removing his mustache, Superman should have just come back with a beard. Yeah, and like, just had him rock a beard the whole time because it's easy. Yeah, and then your final can. shot, he's clean shaven again. They already had that shot in the can. Like, yeah, like that's stupid. <laughs> Just, I mean, decisions like give him a tight, you know, beard like in here, like no big deal. That's that's a much simpler, easier route. Um, but then we get like the the so after Brainiac's destroyed, everybody in Smallville wakes up. Clark goes back to Smallville and kind of does this like you know, soul searching journey. He meets John Henry, Lana's new boyfriend, because you know, at this time, he's you know, dating Wonder Woman and. You know, they, they have this whole thing about not needing Superman because the people can help and save themselves as heroes. And I mean, it's all good, but it's like I just like it's like they build up this really convoluted story for Doomed. And then like they end it like convolutedly with him and Brainiac. And sometimes I just like my storytelling a little bit more simple because then I'm like, what exactly just happened? Well, I mean, yeah. what he what he ended what he ended up doing was taking Brainiac into a black hole. Um, that's what he ended up doing was taking Brainiac into a black hole, and then there doesn't really seem to be much of an explanation for it. But he Superman escapes the black hole, and when he returns, he does mention like it being like in the back of his mind or something. But other than that, like he comes back fine out of the black hole and no longer plagued by the uh, doomsday virus. And I'm just like, okay. I, I, I just feel uh, super Dune was an awesome idea that I feel like just didn't get, I don't know. Like I almost wish there would have been the Brainiac story, then the super doom story. And not have them so much overlap. Well, as the new 52 went, it was kind of almost like event to event to event to event. You know, it was everybody had something going on. You know, you look in the mm -hmm. Batman book and it was, you know, event after event after event in the in the Batman book and all of those tie ins. Superman, same thing, event after event. And then they all had to be involved in the Justice League events. You know, it was like, it was like ever the world was constantly in peril, you know. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a, a, a character stories and and the groupings of characters that that orbit them. You know I mean, it was always 
an event after an event. So they, they always, they were overlapping all these stories constantly. Like we got this Brainiac story, which started back in Psy War, uh, which is supposed to connect to a story in action comics. So it was that action comic story into like Psy War into this, and then ultimately into Convergence. I mean, yes. <laughs> I feel like that was the pro. Like so much of this felt like it was being rushed. Like do this now. Like they didn't want to take time for stories. Sometimes I don't know. Well, they had to get to. They had to get to some point five years. You know, like that's kind of where their starting point was for a lot of the new Fifty Two stuff. There was like five years from the origin of like most of these characters to to where they are now. So they had to be like. Well, certain stories, if we're going to say started within that five years, like they have to fit there and then we can expand upon them later on. It was, I mean, I, I'm betting on paper, you know, on the dry erase board, on your timeline, you know, as, as you, you, you map them out, they probably work. Uh, they probably looked good. You know, but as you're writing stories and you're having to jump forward in time, jump back in time. I mean, they, New Fifty Two also had Future's End. That one, know? and that's what that so, storyline. <laughs> I felt like. Did you have you read that Isaiah? I have not. It felt like this really great story that should have been a big deal that was gone that they put it out at the wrong time. That just kind of got forgotten that it actually happened. I know, I remember I did read the Batman Beyond series that kind of has fun out of that, where it's Tim Drake mm-hmm. and Batman Beyond instead of Terry McGinnis, but I never actually read the, the, the book. It was pretty, it was pretty wild. About to kill um, this cat. Some, it had some good chapters, but there was, there was a lot that was, you know, almost filler. So let, let's, let's recap. Like, this, like I said, this book is a lot. Um, overall, what, final thoughts and a, and a letter grade rating for the book. We'll start with Isaiah. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I'd say maybe like, cause like I thought it was good, but there were like maybe some pacing problems and like where there's a little, a little too much of the time. So maybe like not an A, but maybe like a B or a C, maybe somewhere in the middle. Cause for sure not the worst thing I've ever read. Um, I'd like say it's just solid, like average, like, okay. Probably, um, I would say that like, it's better than probably... I was like, like, I don't feel like I ever seen anybody talking about it or anything. And I feel like it at least deserves that a little bit. Um, so probably like a B or a C. Okay. Okay. Mr. Cole. Um, I probably give it around a B minus, um, you know, lots of things you said, there's a lot of great chapters. There's a really, there's some really good moments in it, but you know, as 500 pages and, and having to have so many tie-in stories, um, it's very thick. I mean, I think it all kind of surprisingly goes together with so many writers and different artists, not to mention there's some great art in this book too. Um, so yeah, I give it a, I give it a B minus though. Um, good story, but you know, I think it stumbles over itself in places to, to pick up threads and to, to build up for future stories you know, kind of leaves you, leaves you hanging. And then when you get to the tie-ins, you know, you see Supergirl as a Red Lantern, but then when you get to one of her tie-ins, she is no longer a Red Lantern anymore. But you don't get to see that unless you're reading Supergirl as well. And it's not like necessarily part of this tie-in. Yeah, I agree. Um, I am going to give it a C plus. I feel that the idea is there. There's a lot of good pieces in here. I feel that they tried to do too much, too many tie-ins and everything, and it kind of just brought down the... I would have liked more of the psychological battle, the Jekyll Hyde. Um, so. but yeah. I do have the old Dooms, uh, Superman Doomed figure from the Mattel multiverse line. So do I. It's actually technically Solomon's because he loved Doomsday, and I couldn't find a Doomsday figure for the longest time, so I got him that one. So. Mm. So, yeah. All right, we'll go. We'll go around. Um, Isaiah, anything you want to plug? Socials, anything like that? Uh, yes, I can't. I think on Instagram, I think my page is just Isaiah Simmons Art, or Isaiah Simmons Artist. Um, and then on Twitter, I believe it's just I Simmons, and then underscore, and then Art, 
Um, and that's really, those are, like, I have, I have, like, you know, um, Reddit and Tumblr and all that, but, like, Instagram and Twitter are really my main two, so that's where I'll be posting the most, and so if you want to look at that. Yeah, um, always check out his artwork. I love his artwork. It's, like, um, it's in the spirit of, like, a Darwin cookieism and uh, another artist that right now is evading my mind, but it's great art. I love it. So. Thank you. All right, check it out. We'll have links in the show notes. And remember, look up in the sky. We want to thank you for checking out the Krypton Report podcast. And we ask you to check us out on all of our social media on Twitter X, Facebook, Instagram, Blue Sky, Hive, Threads, YouTube. We're everywhere. And if you want to be a guest on the podcast, just send us a message and let us know. If you are like Tyler and James and can't get enough super talk, Check out these other podcasts. Digging for Kryptonite, Supergirl Radio, The Last Sons of Krypton, The Superboy Legacy Podcast, All-Star Superfans, Superman the Animated Podcast, The Aspiring Kryptonians, Always Hold On to Smallville, The Geek of Steel, and Truth, Justice, and Hope. Tyler here. Hope you're enjoying the podcast today. I just want to talk about some another project I've really been working on. It's the requel. It used to be just part of our Patreon, and we still do Patreon exclusives. But I've really pumped it up, and I've had started inviting friends to join me as we pitch movie ideas. I I ask everyone if they can go and check it out. It's under Jonathan Tyler Patrick on my YouTube, and go like it, subscribe, and if you want to come on and pitch an idea, come on, just check it out. It's a fun time. I am Brian Peters, the creator and host of Gravely Amusing. For the past 30 years, I've studied the history of gods and monsters in pop culture and our world. As a student of theology and history, I've tried to understand evil and its impact on us. As a writer, I've tried to share this knowledge. As a comedian, I've tried to make people laugh as I do it. But as a man-child, I'm still that scared seven-year-old boy. Join me as I share the history of horror and sci-fi, discuss classic and modern pop culture, and share a creepy story or two. This podcast may scare you, it may horrify you, or it may leave you gravely amused. Listen to Gravely Amusing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and wherever podcasts are found. Follow us on Twitter at Gravely underscore Amusing or on TikTok at Gravely Amusing. We have a $1 Patreon. Yes, I know everyone asks for money, but our $1 Patreon each month gets you commentary tracks for releasing movies, DC movies. It gets you my requel series where I pitch ideas about movie sequels, prequels, or whatever. It also gets special bonus episodes. So check that out for $1 a month. That's all we ask. Keep it cheap, keep it simple, and help us keep going. Check out the link in the show notes or Patreon Krypton Report. This is Dan Jurgens, and if you want to have a good time, keep listening to the Krypton Report.